The breaking of bonds requires energy. This is a fundamental law of thermodynamics. We walk along the river, arms crossed, me, hands in his pockets, him. The river is very polluted, I say. Take care of yourself, he says. College students jump in there all the time. It's three meals a day and the occasional glass of wine. One in ten succeed. The other nine swim to shore terrified. Did you hear what I said? Yes, three meals a day taken with wine. Packing commences. He, If he is to start in the fall, he must leave in early summer to set up his lab. The dog is frantic but strategic. He sits on shoes so Eric won't pack them. He sits on clothes so Eric won't fold them. He sits inside luggage bags so Eric won't close them. I try to lure him away with treats, big juicy marrow bones, beef jerky, two scoops of vanilla ice cream, but he doesn't come. Packing takes days. We clean up the spot where he pees. He pees all over Eric's ties. We take these ties to the dry cleaners and wait for them to call us. We clean up the spot where he poops. He poops all over Eric's best suit. We take the suit to the dry cleaner and wait for them to call us. What's wrong with your dog, they ask, willful incontinence. We finish packing when the dog has run out of ideas, but not quite. At the gate, he goes through his repertoire of tricks. Sit, lie down, crawl, play dead, roll over, high five. Sit, lie down, crawl, play dead, roll over, high five. I ask him to please be dignified about this, but I have not yet taught him that command. Dog, Eric says, and bends down to scratch his ears. Man, dog says, and lets out a long howl. Very brows, both of them. A frustrated dog will shed, and now I must follow him around with a lint roller. It's doable, I say to sh the shrink, to drive to Oberlin in one furious night. But that is not love, she says. That is fear of facing your own demons. I don't have demons, I say. I have students and a dog, but at night I do close all my closets out of fear of what might be inside. Dark matter, I believe. I tell the best friend he left, and I let him. He said he would try not to call. What are you going to do, she asks. Not dwell, move forward. What are you really going to do? Stare at spoons. I tell the math student me and the dog make two, and two points to find a line. Remember what Doctor Who said about lines. Not at all interesting. You need three or more to define a shape. The triangle is the strongest of all shapes. When you think geometry, think triangles. The theorem that everybody knows by name, Pythagoras, is a theorem about a triangle. If I could go back in time, I would design an apartment that could not echo. I would revoke sound's ability to echo in the first place. It is the echo and the dark matter that keep me up at night. If I could go back in time, I would sleep and sleep. But Hawking makes a very simple case for why time travel is not possible. No one in the past has ever come forward, and no one in the future has come back. Thank you. Thanks for that little taste. I think it's on. I think it's on. Yeah. OK. Um, I love that you read that excerpt from your book because I have read a lot of um, interviews with you about yeah. what is true to your life right. in chemistry because that's right. always a question that... That's very... Yes. <laughs> that comes up a lot. And, and, um, and the one thing you say is, is spot on is, is the dog. Yeah. The dog is true. That is 100% true. 100% like well, the breed. I, I, the no, I changed the breed. I changed the size. But, you know, <laughs> with dogs. These are the important things we need to know. Well, it, it's sort of like <laughs> you, you when you create a character, you change the name, right? You right. Know? Um, so I changed those physical attributes. And then the actions are kind of very similar to what my dog does. And then you, you imagine a little bit beyond <laughs> right. that, which is not that hard for a dog, I think. No, I yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the internet's around now. The internet's yeah. around. You meet other dogs. <laughs> See other dogs. Yeah. Um, does that question come up for you all the time, though? You've written a novel, a work of fiction. Right. Um, and you have a, a background that kind of looks similar mm -hmm. in some ways to your heroines. I mean, I think I will always be writing around similar themes and similar ideas um, and maybe characters that are very concrete in my mind because I've spent so much time with them. I've always spent a lot of time with myself. But, you know, in the community of where I was educated or where I grew up, these characters are um, abundant. 
So <laughs> I feel I feel like I, I'm kind of just telling stories that I've already known or I've seen or, you know, I've experienced in part, but I haven't experienced completely. And then it's like a patchwork. You put that together sure. into a character or into a story. So when you were studying chemistry mm -hmm. at Harvard, did, <laughs> did you ever look up in a lab and think, oh, this is a good metaphor? Like, no, tell me I, how. I definitely did not. I mean, when I was in lab, I mean, that was that was a pretty dark time in my life. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I think when you're in a in a in a situation that like that, you don't really think about it until afterwards, many years later, and then you think, how can I, how can I make sense of the situation, how I felt at that time, um, and how can I expand that into something bigger? So in this novel, she obviously goes through a PhD program. Um, and it's kind of an escalation of that experience. Um, but also, it's also the stories of people um, that I had spent so much time with in lab because mm -hmm. they were going through their PhD programs and they were not super happy about it. Um, but most of them made it through, but it's like, what if they didn't, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine the impulse. That the impulse, yes. Would, would have. Um, when did you think about writing? As a when did I think about writing? Um, writing as a as a career as a career. Well, I don't think I st I don't think I think about it as a career even <laughs> now. Um, I mean, I think I, I I have to be kind of pragmatic about this. Um, right. A career is something that lasts you for a very long time. What if I run out of things to say in like ten <laughs> years? Um, but but I think the idea is you can write and you can teach as a career. I think that is a career. Um, I hope. Um, but I don't think I thought about writing as a career when I was writing this book. I was thinking that I would just write a book, see what happens, um, and then move forward, you know, do something else, get a job, I don't know, contribute to society, join the workforce um, in a way. Um, and then when this was finished and kind of the debut sort of unraveled and then um, it was well received, I was really surprised. Um, <laughs> and people liked it and you guys are here, that's yeah. that's a surprise. Um, so I think that's what encourages writers to move forward sure. and to continue. Um, yeah, I mean, do you, do you feel the same sort of stress um, that, that the narrator feels in terms of mm. your writing that she feels in terms of her chemistry career? Um, I didn't feel that much stress when I wrote this first novel. Now I feel a lot <laughs> of stress. Um, I think it's once you succeed a little bit, the second time or the third time is much, much harder. Right. Um, you, you're not only trying to figure out you know, how you did it the first time, but also if that was just luck or, I don't know, a, you know, a demon took over and you, you know, wrote the whole <laughs> thing. Um, so I think the... The first time is always just a, it's kind of like a very raw experience and the, the next few times are much more stressful. I don't think it gets easier. It definitely doesn't get no, easier. No, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wonder though, because this is your debut novel mm -hmm. and um, we know that you write in a really deadpan, minimalist kind right. of style. Right. Do you think that's a signature to you or do you think this is um, what your characters evoke? Huh. I mean, I think I do like deadpan, so I, I, I can see that in most of my other stories. Um, minimalistic, sometimes, it depends on what I'm trying to achieve. It depends on the perspective, if I'm doing first person or third person. Um, I think I'm trying to write less minimally, but then I just end up deleting it all, so maybe <laughs> it comes back down to being minimal again. Like, I had, I had this draft that was, you know... I describe things, and then I read it again a few months later, and I just deleted all the descriptors. So now, now we're back to minimal, maybe. Okay. So I think I ex explore, and then I, I sort of tone it down. Um, because so much of writing is um, editing. Yes. And um, it's not this, it's not a performance, right? Um, it's not you go on the stage, and whatever you leave on the stage that night is what you get. Writing has so much thought behind it, mm -hmm. and... So if after a while this is the kind of writing that I like when I hear, when I when I read, and that's myself, then that's essentially what I like to present. Sure. So the development of your the own development. Yeah, it voice. is finding your own voice. I think it's it's every writer, or when you teach writing, or when you're you know telling people to write, that's the first step, like finding your own finding right. your own voice, right? Right. So. 
Um, tell me what you did take away from your chemistry program, aside from huh. excellent knowledge yeah. to, to pepper your book with. Um, uh, discipline. I think the any sort of science background or engineering background or math background, STEM background teaches you to be very, very disciplined. Like you, you can't just picnic and read a book, right? Um, you have to, <laughs> you have to do the work. Um, and that's what you learn as an artist. Eventually, you have to do the work. Right. Um, unless you have a lot of money, then you know you don't <laughs> always need to do the work. But um, in any, you know, STEM taught me that really early on to work a lot every day um and then that translates into art as well mm -hmm. um you read a lot you write a lot you read a lot and then it's like back and forth dialogue between other writers um so in a way that kind of prepared me for doing this and it's so much independent work um when you're in a lab so you know so so it was a good preparation for sitting yeah they the kind of give you a project and they say just figure <laughs> it out you know <laughs> um and, and have the answers been more clear to you in your writing um, than, you know, the, it seems like for the character mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you have to try and throw something against a wall and see if it'll stick. And you yeah. just throw it and throw it and throw right, it. Right, right. You mean for, for, for how, writing? How for to, how oh writing my is. gosh, yeah. It is, it is a lot of throwing things at the wall. <laughs> um, I mean, what about you for your own writing? It's the same, right? When you write essays. Oh, yes. Yeah. Or like organizing things. Yes. Or finding intersections. You know, you do a lot of the pop culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literature intersections. And yeah, I do think um, reading your novel was, was kind of yeah. aspirational in terms <laughs> of the idea that y you can have a solid indecision yeah. about how you're doing in a moment mm -hmm. and still work through <laughs> it. Right, right. Um, because that's sort of, yeah, that's what writing is, right. a lot of indecision. It's, it's yes, and then you have to make choices. And then you have to make choices, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else I wanted to cover. So who were you, who was the conversation you were having in your head when you were writing the book? Who, who were you reading? What were you thinking about? Um, so when I was writing this, <clears throat> that's actually kind of an interesting question. So when I was writing this, I had already read, um, so one of my teachers was Sigrid Nunez at BU. I'd already read her book, Feather on the Breath of God. Mm. Um, and. A long time ago, I had read Amy Hempel's Tumble Home, and it was kind of the synthesis of those two books in my mind, um, creating that um, idea of doing a collage structure, but obviously you have to tell a story chronologically, right. um, and figuring out how to go between you know, characters and ideas quickly. So I was, I was doing that. Um, but this book came out pretty quickly in terms of writing the draft. I mean, that's not true for the second book. The second book is so <laughs> much harder. Um, but the first book was, because, because I mean, the first book should be a little easier in terms of writing because you've lived up until that point and you have all of this material. Hopefully, right, it, right. You, know, you have like 30 something years of material or, some, or even more, <laughs> depending on when you write your first book. Um, and then it, it's kind of a organization. But with the second book, you have to think about refilling the well, right? Right. Of experiences. And what have you sought out particular experiences for the second? No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> okay. um, it's it's a lot of figuring out sorting because this is not this book is not an enca encapsulation of everything I've experienced or or sure. um, or my background. So it's figuring out how to use my own background and then what I know and what I've researched um, to kind of create a new story, maybe around similar themes or similar ideas. Um, but in literary fiction, which is what this book is, <laughs> it comes it comes to terms that it doesn't really matter what you're writing. It really just matters how you're writing it sure. and how you're structuring it and how you can give the reader maybe an enjoyable experience, but also um, play with language, play with um, um, play with form, I think, and develop the voice more. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, translation. Translation, yes. Translation, both, um, you know, your your character um, thinks in Chinese sometimes and then moves to English, mm -hmm. but also how do you, for us English majors here, how do you translate 
what happens in science for us. Right. Um, so I, th I think basic science is pretty easy um, to translate and, and read. You know, um, the reason most people are terrified of this subject is there's so much jargon, and that's what scientists would want you to believe, right? Like you learn, you go to school, you learn the jargon, so therefore. Um, there's such a divide, right? I mean, if you go see a doctor, it's the same idea. There's so much medical jargon. But the basis of science is actually supposed to be simple. This is, um, and to understand it should be simple. And if you can explain it in a simple way, um, in a crystallized way, and kind of teach it to someone, I think that's actually much more helpful than sitting in a tower of jargon mm -hmm. um, and then sort of talking to the other tower of jargon. Um, so in translating the science, it wasn't so difficult. It was more of w figuring out what I wanted to tell and how I wanted to tell it, right? Like, you know, if you, that, the, the breaking of bonds, that is a fundamental law of thermodynamics. Right. But if you go to a textbook, they obviously word it differently. They use sure. passive voice. Yes. They use bigger words. Um, and the sentence structure is, you know, compound complex. It's not a simple sentence structure. And that's, that's how a textbook is written. But if somebody w were just telling you this idea um, orally, I think it would be a much simpler way of describing it. Which I, which I think is yeah. what you did in this book. So I think that's what, yeah, that's what I was trying to do with <laughs> some of the science concepts. Excellent. And, and talk a little bit about the Chinese element. The too. Chinese. Um, so I speak Chinese. I'm pretty fluent in it. I, I read it. I write it. So that wasn't so difficult for me to translate but I think with Chinese translations I, I do I, I like the literal translation a little bit more than like the the strange maybe Americanized translation that makes it sound very you know like dragons and <laughs> jade and it's it, like the sentences are just too long the, the core of Chinese is actually it's very simple the the words come together in a very beautiful and simple way um, and I kind of wanted to do that in English so to to express the tone of maybe a Chinese idiom, it should not take, you know, nine words. It should take something like four or three or two, um, because it should be crisp and not like, like very laborious sure. to translate. And just as a reminder to the people who might have read your book when it came out in hardcover, right. in Chinese, chemistry means something a little different than how we think of it. Yeah. Which um, you mean the the passage about yeah, the passage about, yeah. The passage about chemistry? Do that. <laughs> you want me to read it? No, oh, but just okay. just talk just talk to us about it. Oh yeah. Um, so when I <laughs> that passage was actually added in after we titled the book, <laughs> which wow. is interesting. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's how it sort of books come together. Um, we didn't know it was going to be called chemistry. It kind of went in really without a title. Um, so. So the the word chemistry um, in Chinese is huaxue. So it's it's kind of the the idea of um, the way I put it in that paragraph was it was you know the idea of change, right? Um, and with with hua, I had put that in um, a passage where the snow was melting because hua in Chinese also means melt, um, but it, it's written differently. But um, it's the same sound. And Chinese is very known, it's known for their homonyms, it's known for that kind of pun. And I really wanted to put that in a section where I could really develop it um, and sort of make it a little bit more resonant. Um, so when I had put that in, it was near the end where she is sort of feeling like maybe she's reaching, she's not changing entirely, but there's a sense that there could be potential for change. Mm -hmm. Um, and the snow is melting, and I thought it was just like a nice transition. Um, but obviously, I, I didn't want to explain that, right? The whole point is, you know, sure. you, you don't want to explain it because then you lose the idea. Um, but that was kind of how I was working Chinese into the book. But that's what makes talking about it even right. more fascinating. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of back to pressures, yeah, um, both from family and peers. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'll give you an example from my life. Um, my husband is also a writer. Okay. And yesterday he put his laptop on his computer mm -hmm. and did a little of this. And then at the end of the day, he was like, I wrote 2,500 words. Oh my God. 
and I sort of wanted to slap him a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> That's insane. That's crazy. And and <laughs> and do you feel that kind of thing with writing? Are there people who you th- who you know the the character, of course, in 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 the book, mm-hmm. um, sees her boyfriend just propel up this one straight mm-hmm. path to greatness. That's and, true. Uh, yeah. Um, so I had intentionally made that character perfect. I don't think I'm going to do that again for the second novel. It's, it's hard to have a perfect character. <laughs> um, the reason I had actually put in so many problems where I'm like, he had problems with his family, you know, he had pr- other problems, but when we were editing it, it, one of the good suggestions was just take it out. Right. Um, so to make Eric this essentially perfect guy, um, who has this great career, who is super stable mentally and seems to still love her despite that she's falling apart. Um, so I wanted it to be almost a no brainer decision for her. Right. Right. Um, and it's written in first person. And when you think about first person, it's always from the character's point of view and not from the other person's. Um, so when I was, you know, the, the idea is that Eric is always just a straight path. Like the, 25,000, 25,000, 2,500, 2,500 words. 2,500. I mean, 25,000 would be, (laughs) I would actually be bragging at that point. Yeah. That's like half a novel. novel. Uh, So, um, I guess it, it's the it's the sense that when she sees somebody so prolific or so great in his own work without any sort of doubts, it just makes her feel even worse, right? It's like if Eric didn't exist, maybe she wouldn't have quit, right? Maybe she would have just right. like gone through without any idea of what the contrast was. Um, so really what, what he became was a study in contrast between these two people and how they're trying to keep their relationship together despite... This bitterness that I think is always brewing when yes. your partner is very, very successful at something <laughs> and you're in the same field, um, which I think is the advice is maybe don't find somebody in the same field who's much more successful than you. Um, find Oops. somebody in a different field. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's one day. <laughs> you can you can write 3,000 the next you. day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, in terms of the relationship uh-huh. with Eric. Um, bef- I'm, I'm trying to not spoil anything either. Um, did you leave it um, a little open on purpose? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, I th- I sort of like those ambiguous endings. Um, you know, the idea is that the story continues in your head, whether they stay together, whether they don't stay together. Um, I didn't quite know that's where I wanted to end until I was maybe a couple pages before. Um, and that's how it works with endings or it, at the beginning, you already know it depends on the book. Um, so with, with this ending, the ending is, um, you, you know, you don't know if they're going to come together or not. You don't know if they're going to stay friends, but it's her getting better and then realizing that if she's better then she can reach out. Right. Um, and I think the idea is whether or not they're together, she's a little bit better. So that's, that's good. And you, you know, even if he doesn't want to come back, um, you should at least appreciate that she's better or she helped herself get better in a way, um, without him. So, that that's kind of where I wanted her to be at the end is that there's such potential for something to happen because she's kind of come done this sort of short but immense journey. And so if Eric is the comparison that's like the perfect the straight perfect, yeah. Route, mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the best friend. Right. So there's um the best friend is comes up in the second part a little bit more and she is also seemingly perfect, right, at the beginning. You know, the first half is just everybody seems perfect, and when you're surrounded by people who are more successful, sometimes can be hard to succeed yourself. Um, in the second part, the 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 best one has to come in more because Eric left, but it was also that she was, um, she has a great career, but then she has problems in her personal life, so in kind of a way that the the narrator is coming to terms with her career troubles um the best friend is 
coming to terms with their personal troubles. Um, and I, I really wanted those two trajectories to align a little bit um, so that they're kind of together one full character in a way that they, you know, one person uh, has a great career, but then the, the personal life and that kind of thing. Um, and they're both dealing with their relationships. Um, and so the second half is, I guess it's mostly a, the best friend, her, and then their the little kid who's a girl, um, sort of three women trying to figure things out well you know the baby's obviously trying to figure things out <laughs> um but, but but that's where i structurally saw the novel at the end sure yeah. um and in terms of the future i think you also leave a little room yeah. for for the friend well i think i wanted the friend and that marriage to kind of work out in a difficult way I, I think it would be too easy if you know they just split up and then nothing happened um so I wanted them to stay together um and in a way to teach her that you know nothing life is not super binary um right. which is how she really starts off this right. novel is like you're either really successful or you're me right <laughs> um or Right. So she needs to be able to figure out that there's a spectrum of emotions and outcomes for herself. She uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I botch this, but there's a section where she says her dad always says, don't compare yourself to. Yeah. Someone you have. You can't compare yourself to somebody worse. Yeah. You can only compare yourself to someone better. And even that is kind of a binary yeah it's true about it. it's true well the <laughs> idea of a comparison right it's always a to b you, right right comparing right two things right um but it's like she, he was trying to do this out of love and she just she kind of just runs with it you know it, it I, I guess in a in a humorous way have people watched um talladega nights where the dad is like if you're not first or last <laughs> you know in a, in a weird way it is this dynamic of if you're not winning you're losing or if you're not comparing yourself to somebody better you're losing right it, it's this um it's this game so. and do you think that is prevalent in academia too mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think that's definitely pretty prevalent in, in kind of comparisons, um, because it's, academia is so quantifiable, right? Like how many papers do you have? Mm -hmm. Do those journals have high impact factor, which is, you know, the citation value of those papers. So like so a journal like science would have a really, really huge impact factor. Um, so it's everything in that is so quantifiable that it is really comparative, right? If you go into STEM, you are kind of a number. You are your test scores, you are your GPA, um, and you are your letter of recs, right? It's three to four letter of recs, <laughs> <laughs> always. Um, so I do think that in terms of um, the comparison, it, it's just impossible not to compare, right? Yeah, There's absolutely. just nothing subjective, really, no. <laughs> in, in academia. Yeah, I mean, so, so take me from being kind of in the world of STEM mm -hmm. and then going into the world of writing. And, you mm -hmm. know, STEM is, of course, a, an incredibly male-dominated field. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed a difference in the publishing world? Have you mm. noticed a different feel? Are there similarities right. in some ways? Right. Um, well, I, I mean, the in, in STEM, one of the nice things, you know, was that most people I worked with did not really care if I was a male or a female or unless I just, you know, as long as I got the work done, it, the, the advisor was completely blind to really those kind of things. Um, I think in, <clears throat> in literature, sometimes those, I, I never felt that, you know, as a sort of as a, I guess as an Asian American writer, there's just a little bit more responsibility on my plate to write about certain ideas or to represent a, a sto storyline. Um, I don't think I'm as free to maybe create something completely random as maybe perhaps my um, Caucasian male counterpart. Um, and maybe that burden is just more on me, um, but it, it feels just like I have this responsibility to kind of represent some of the stories or tell stories in a certain way. Um, it's not you know, I, I'm not starting at baseline, right? It's not a blank slate. Um, in in STEM, 
I, I do agree it's very male dominated, but I think in a, in a few decades it probably won't be. Um, a lot of women in that field do pretty well. Um, and because it's so quantitative, it's hard to, if you're successful, you're going to be successful. The reason it takes so long is the people making these decisions are committees of men, right? Right. So the more people who get up there to make decisions, it's just a very, very slow process. But I think work-wise, it didn't feel quite that, it felt like actually both 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 genders were doing equal amounts of work. It's good work, right? That was slowly being recognized. Excellent. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess you could say that that's kind of the situation in in the book world too. Yeah. Like that, there are just tons of women right. who are killing it. Yeah. But there are men at the top yeah. making the ultimate making the decisions. decisions. I mean, you just you have to wait for people to pass on right <laughs> that's just but that, that is in academia Indeed. you just you, yes. for a tenure job you wait for somebody to die like that's yep. what you say yeah um yeah and probably at random house too <laughs> <laughs> Hi, <everyone. laughs> um so it's just it just takes time one of those things that takes time absolutely um do you see any other um similarities between the writing and the and and science. Hmm. Um, clarity is really important for writing. Mm. Um, at least that's something I value. I think clarity is really important in STEM um, because if you don't, if you're not clear, you you gen generate fear, right? I mean, that's the current era that we live in. Um, and I think that's true for writing. You don't want the reader to misinterpret anything that you say. Um, you don't want readers to bring in you know, on assumptions or you don't want readers to sort of get a different idea or an agenda that you have. And I think that the objectiveness of the writer is really important. Like you're the witness. You're not, you're not sitting there to, to preach to people about your opinions. You're there to really talk about <clears throat> what you see, how you, how you think this kind of issue is playing out, but also having empathy for all of your other characters that hopefully are looking at the issue from different um, angles, and I think in as a scientist, your goal is not really to always say your hypothesis is right, unless it is right. If your hypothesis <laughs> is right, then you should talk about it. But your goal is to present the results as is, um, and in a way, you are a witness to what's happening in nature. Um, just like as a writer, you're kind of a witness to human relationships, human conditions, stories, and that nature. So all of humanity is kind of your lab when you're a writer. <laughs> Maybe in a way. That's kind of broad and a little yes, scary. I, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> you make it so clear and then I just... No, no, no. Show. You are very right. <laughs> um, should we take some questions? Anybody? Yeah. Um, well, you just know it's on the table now. Um, and we can keep talking. We can talk. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm actually going to consult my notes because I did make notes. Um, I, w this is just like a little side note that I have and I want to ask you about, um, the, the narrator says that in spoken Chinese, everything is gender neutral. Mm -hmm. There's no he or she. And the more I think about this now, the more I like this about the language. Mm -hmm. Um, was that a consideration when you chose to make the narrators, to make the, the name of the narrator un, untold? I mean, yeah, that's a good, that's a good thesis. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think as a writer, you never know until you finish it. And then other readers say, is this a reason? I think at the time, I just had this gut feeling that I didn't want to name her. Um, had you ever? No, I'd never, I'd never named her. There was not even, you know, I always named Eric. Um, and then that was it. And then I didn't name anyone else. So that hadn't changed in the editing process. Um, I sometimes think if I, it, you know, if I can avoid the name, sometimes I just do. Um, and maybe that's, right. um, I, I do think that's a little bit of the first person. When you're a first person, you don't really think, ah, I'm going to talk about myself in the third person now. Right, right, Character right. name is going to do this. Um, so that was one reason that never came up, like that name. Um, and she's stuck in her head most of the time. So, you know, it's that doesn't really come up. Um, and then when I started to get to the second half, the idea of language started to become more prevalent. Um, the idea of, you know, 
um, being a little bit more universal, having this character be mm -hmm. universal, um, having her understand maybe Chinese a little bit more. Um, that may be factored into that I was just not gonna name her. I don't think I wanted to name her because what would I name her? You know, if she had a she had an American name, there'd be you know wh how would I go about just explaining that? If she had a Chinese name, how would I go about explaining that? There's just like another layer that I didn't want to get in. It's Interesting. Already. In in your next book, is the does the main character have? A yeah, name? the next the next <laughs> book, the two I did I did decide to name the two main characters, um, but, but I don't think I'm gonna name other people. Maybe we'll see. Excellent. And the dog? The dog. Oh, this dog. Yeah. Um, same thing, universal dog? Universal dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't name the dog. What's your dog's name? My dog's name is Biscuit. I didn't mean to like you know, <laughs> be too personal no, here, but I, okay. I needed to know. Yeah. Um, mine is Busy. Your name is Busy? Your, your dog's name is Busy? Yes. Oh, that's a good name. So... Yeah, I wanted to hear more about having immigrant <coughs> parents growing up and mm -hmm. being um, 30 and 20 something women growing independent of them. And yeah, and about uh, having a sense of oldness to mm -hmm. your parents yeah. and then you realize that you didn't. Did everyone hear that, or should I repeat? Yeah, you can. You can. Okay, good. <laughs> um, talk about a little bit about um, the immigrant experience and mm -hmm. parental expectations. Um, so, becoming independent from your parents is is hard. I think I think that's there's no way around that. It's an incredibly difficult process. Um, I think with immigrant parents, it's even harder because, you know, s s it. If, if you just take the immigrant thing out of the equation, right, um, there's so many things people talk to their parents about that I would never be able to talk to my parents about, right? Like, like music. I, I don't, I don't think they know who Michael Jackson is, you know, so I would never be able to talk about that. The Beatles, probably not. Um, you know, Queen, everything that I like. It, as you grow older, the things that you like start to completely kind of fall off from the things that they like. Um, and... You're le because you leave the nest, um, there's so much, it's the, I guess the feeling is that you leave the nest and you don't even really have the language anymore because you're kind of in this world where it's not really your parents. It's like a, it's like a world that your parents don't really understand. And, and I think for me becoming independent, you just had to do it, right? It's, it's a sink or swim mentality. I mean, I couldn't go back. Um, so you're in the world and you, you kind of have to figure out your own way. Um, and with expectations, I think expectations come from, I don't think expectations should be too burdensome, but it, it they are. I mean, the reason parents have expectations is of immense love, right? Um, and the expectation is that you can probably succeed, right? You know, you parents wouldn't have expectations they didn't know that you could do it um, because your parents tend to know you better than most people. Um, so I think when I was um, dealing with these kind of sets of expectations, the the way that I kind of went around it was that it's better to maybe instead of, um, it is a burden, but to get through the burden, it's, it's kind of doing something, creating something that you can really stand behind or um, succeeding in a way that, can kind of overturn their expectations because if they don't know they if they came here knowing one path they're not going to know other paths like they're not going to know how to make it into a literary world they're not going to know you know other careers right um so they're giving you a career path that they know and i actually think when you get older you start to see so many other avenues and one way to kind of overturn those is to su succeed in one avenue that they don't expect um and it kind of throws them for a loop. And then they actually do kind of start to see you as an adult, um, that you did this by yourself without really asking them for money, which is good. Like, right? <laughs> Parents never want it when kids ask them for money. Um, and you were able to stand on your own two feet, right? And that's what they taught you to do. Um, and then the burden is still there, but it becomes, they worry less and it kind of slowly with time just fades. Um, the question of, you know, with immigrant parents, there's the debt is, is I mean, you're just never going to pay it back, unfortunately. Um, so I think one of the ways is you live with it and you say there's this debt, but you're also in this really cool generation where you're experiencing that kind of that kind of event and that kind of feeling. Um, 
And it's something that I think drives ambition. It drives um, focus. Um, and it's ways to turn something that is very burdensome into something positive and productive. But to think that you're ever going to pay your parents back, I think is you shouldn't start there. I don't, even if you're not an immigrant, I think it's impossible to pay your parents back. It, it is just, they put in so much love into nurturing you. Um, and I think they don't really want to be paid back eventually. You know, they say they do, right? We're going to, we're going to, you know, give us a check for all of the college money and all the food that we spent on you. But I think in real life, they don't, right? They just say these things, but they're actually, the payback is seeing that you succeed um, or kind of surprise them. I think parents like it when kids surprise them not like going to jail surprise but 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 <laughs> succeed in, in a surprising way <laughs> yeah um, we've talked mostly about your transition from chemistry to writing but mm -hmm. there's a part in there that got left out which was your phd in PhD, yes. yes now that's a very critical position for somebody mm -hmm. to put themselves in and it's going to become even more important in the years to come because right. you know environmental crises right. et cetera, et cetera. so i'm wondering one whether that was a personal decision mm -hmm. for you to get the phd in that particular area and what made you leave mm -hmm. that mm. so i had done um did everyone hear by the way yeah yeah okay yeah no public health is a really really good career. I would recommend it. It's very stable. Um, so I had gone in to a PhD um, before I did the MFA. Um, I was, you know, I was younger. So it, it, the idea is to stay in school as long as possible before you can figure out what you want to do. So I chose, um, I did epidemiology, which is essentially biostatistics, because I was very, I'm, I'm a very quantitative person. Um, so it was a, it was a d degree that's very suited my abilities. Um, and I think when I when I finished, I knew I wanted to finish it because it it's something it's it's Plan B or it was Plan A if I didn't succeed with the novel. Um, and I think when I turned this novel in as my thesis, my goal was to get a job in public health. I, I think I wanted to get a job in public health, do the postdoc. Um, but then the novel kind of took off, and then um, I kind of went along with it. Um, so right now, I'm, I'm still doing a little bit of public health, but it wouldn't be the same amount that I was doing if I went into a postdoc or if I got a job in public health. Um, hopefully, you know, I think what helps me with public health is that it's the background. I, can, I feel like I hopefully can, in the future can write about public health or essays in this, um, you know, understanding large health data because um, that's something that I'm interested in. But for right now, I think it's, um, I'm trying to focus on maybe the writing aspect. Um, and public health is something that I will do, but maybe it's not something that, you know, I would do sort of as rigorously I would have done before this novel. So. Um, so I'm a chemistry PhD student um, who is living in the white boyfriend from Maryland who plays drums. Um, really? Wow. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. So, yeah, I thought it was about me. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the scene where the boyfriend, Eric, meets with the main character's parents and the whole like art di dynamics mm -hmm. helps with the language. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I often thought about mm -hmm. um, where my white boyfriend doesn't really get it, so I wanted to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, it, that, that's, uh, yeah. Um, I think meeting parents is difficult, no matter if you don't understand the language. <laughs> but I think the hard Liar. thing, it, yeah, it's always hard. It's always <laughs> hard. Um, the way I wrote the scene in the novel is that I wanted to figure out what was difficult about it. I think what is difficult about it is the lack of, it's not just the lack of communication. It's just when my parents speak in English, they're just not themselves. They're like, they're this weird version of themselves. They're this like very plain version. They're not, I, you know, they're, they're very funny people in a very sarcastic and deadpan way, but it just never, it never comes out. Right. And I think I'm always just so depressed that nobody can see that. Um, and I think likewise, 
um, when some of my friends or um, my significant other meets my parents, it's it's the same idea. It's like they want to express something, but they can't get it across, right? So so much is lost in translation. And one of the things is humor. It's just if you don't understand the language, you 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 don't understand the humor. Um, and to understand any culture, you have to understand the language, which is which is humor based, right? Most languages, jokes, puns, sort of like riffs, that kind of thing. The ability to play off of each other in language is really important. Um, and I think when that is gone, it just becomes a very, very awkward experience. So um, I think you have to fill the void, right? You fill the void by like playing games or, you know, doing something that is a little bit less language based and a little bit more activity based, I think. So. Anything else? That's where dogs help again. That is where dogs help, actually. That's a good point. <laughs> Get a dog. <laughs> Do you have a dog? <laughs> there you go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah. Oh okay. A person can fill the void. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? There is, but I'm not. I'm not doing it. Um, I think I would botch it up. It would be. It wouldn't be a very good translation. But that isn't. You know, Chinese translations. It's. It's one of those things where if I read it, I wouldn't be able to sort of master the subtleties, right? Like English is such a beautiful language, and that there is so many subtleties. So is Chinese, but I don't think I've, I'm advanced enough to sort of understand the subtleties. So, it's one of those things where I, I can read it, and I can understand the surface value, but then. I wouldn't be able to really get underneath as well. But I think that's, you know, the difference between like a native speaker and somebody who can actually, yeah. Did you have? It's curious, uh, the, the narrator spends a lot of her time being us a lot for not being good at chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I guess the big difference between her and her boyfriend is that you always need to, like, not that he's good at it, but just that he likes it. Yeah. And curious. What her mindset is, why she sees it that way. Um, why she why she doesn't like it, or why she why she sees him as being good at it. When he doesn't, I don't know. There doesn't really hold on evidence that he's actually a great chemist. Like, yeah, he no, at a right. arts college, Yeah, not at like a national research university. He just like teaching. Damn. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my dad's history professor at a liberal arts college. Yeah, and it's basically you go there if you like teaching, you care yeah. about the subject, not yeah. the yeah, that's true. I mean, he's not in an R1 school. That is true. Um, well, I think the light goes a long way. And I think Eric is one of those characters. I mean, the way he is as a character and as a person is that even if he was unsure, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say it, right? He's sort of one of those people who... Um, if he's 60% confident, he's 100% confident, right? Whereas she, even if she's 60% confident, she's 0% she's confident. So there's this level of just natural difference in how they feel about their subjects, but also um, how confident they are as individuals. Like she's just easily discouraged. Um, and I mean, I think that comes from maybe not liking the subject as much. She links the like with accomplishment, accomplishment with like. Um, she, does, she doesn't like it that much. And then so it's easy to get discouraged from it. But I think chemistry wise, they're probably actually in my mind when I was writing it, I think they're actually pretty equal footing, right? If she actually just finished, she would be fine. Um, but then the question becomes, does she like it? You know, is that important, right? She sees that Eric likes it, and even though she, he's not gonna, you know, win a Nobel Prize or something like that, he's still really, really happy doing what he is. And she's sort of wondering, even if I win a Nobel Prize, am I gonna be that happy, right? I mean, that's depressing if, you know, you win a Nobel Prize and you're not gonna be happy. Um, so she's trying to find something where, if she can just do a little success, she'll be happy. Um, and that probably isn't, you know, chemistry for her. Um, so, it, you know, that is an interesting question of how much, when we like something, how what, what goes into that like. And for Eric, it's so pure, right? He just likes it. Um, and for her, there's just there's just so many factors of why she, she likes something. Um, she's trying to find the pure component. And and that said, she although she doesn't succeed in a career in that path, right. 
she clearly understands it mm -hmm. and and uses it in her day to day life in a way that makes her sound like an expert. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess she's an expert in some things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I actually have a follow-up question to that. Cause, um, so the sense that I got was that she still likes the science itself because she constantly talks about it. So I couldn't really get like why she thinks herself as not liking chemistry. like Because I feel like I have points where I don't like chemistry and I don't talk about science like she does. <coughs> So yeah, I was just kind of confused on that part. Um, is she so? Were you thinking that she's so gonna pursue something else in science? Or? Oh, I think she likes teaching it. I actually think that what happened at the end is she really enjoyed teaching it. Um, so she does like communicating in, in a scientific way. Um, I think one of the aspects of why she didn't like it in the end is this is in any field, not just in chemistry. When you're in any field, the goal is to push the field forward, right? You have to, you have to push. Um, so I didn't think she saw herself as at the edge pushing, you know, Eric could have maybe saw himself there, but he, she didn't really see herself as sort of the innovator. Um, and she kind of wanted to figure out a way or someplace that she could innovate. And maybe that's just how she, she, she's a better teacher than she is a researcher. Um, so I think, you know, she can like science and a lot of my friends who went through PhDs, they do really actually love, they love science, but then it's the whole research of it that becomes really difficult. Um, just like in writing, if you go into writing, the, the goal is, and you know, when I was doing my MFA program, the goal was always you had to invent, like you had to innovate. And there's so much pressure, right? You're just, it, it's just your creative mind trying to innovate, try to produce something new. You can't do the same thing over and over again. Um, so that pressure gets to her a little bit. Um, and that pressure for other people, maybe in the research sciences is not as daunting, right? It's like, I'm going to be up for the challenge. But I think for her, it was really discouraging. So... Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, yeah, guys. Thank Those you are great guys questions. For, for now. Um, are you going to sign over there? Yeah, I think so.